I always am left wondering quite what the metaphor or the allusion is there. Well, I don't know if uh, Mr. Yanukovych is about to take a pill or what's happening, but <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm sure that meant something to somebody. Um, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are looking now at scenarios for Ukraine, and this whole session is conducted in conjunction with the World Economic Forum. And for just a second, I'm going to explain a little bit of background. The, the WEF is working with Ukraine on a long-term project, and, and the aim is to explore uh, the country's economic transformation, how to handle economic development in Ukraine. Uh, the WEF is helping a consultation process with hundreds of stakeholders, sorry for using that word, but it keeps reappearing, stakeholders in, in Ukraine, uh, and putting all of the feedback and all of the information that they are picking up into a long-term project which will bear final uh, fruition at the next uh, Davos World Economic Forum early in 2014. Now, President Yanukovych is going to be there, and there is going to be a, a major focus on Ukraine, economic transformation, how best to deliver prosperity and growth to Ukraine. So the WEF is very involved in this, and that's why this particular panel session has been set up in conjunction with them. And it's a, a little bit sort of um, left field in some ways, because we've got lots of different things going on. As you will see, we've got two familiar faces for you on our um, expert panel. We've got Dominic Strauss-Kahn, and forgive me, Dominic and Nouriel, I'm not going to go into the biography again because we've done it before, but we've got Dominic Strauss-Kahn and we've got Nouriel Rabini with us, and they are both going to give us their considered overview of what we can expect in terms of global economic conditions uh, in the next, let's say, five-year span, with particular regard to what it might mean for, for Europe and, and particularly for Ukraine. But I want them to be big picture about where the global economy is going. Now, when they have done that, and I'm hoping there'll be some different perspectives from the two of them, when they've done that, we are going to have a vote. And I'm going to ask you, ultimately, to make some best guesses yourself about some key questions concerning energy, commodities, uh, free trade, but we'll get to that later. All of you, I hope, will see that you've got voting machines, so you can practice looking at them and figure out how we might do the voting, which I'll tell you more about later. So there's then going to be a vote, and then depending on the results of the vote, and I hope you're still with me because this is getting complicated, depending on the results of the vote, we are then going to put different scenarios, depending on what you've decided, to three Ukrainian expert analysts, economists, thinkers, who are going to say how Ukraine can best react to the economic scenarios that you guys have helped to create. So we're going to hear all of that, we're going to discuss it, and then we're going to have a final vote at the end. So a lot of talk over the last 48 hours about the importance of the democratic culture and democratic values. Well, believe me, we've taken it to heart. This is all about democracy for the next 40 minutes. So, you know, it's our chance to have our own voice. So I'm going to stop talking right now, and I'm going to invite uh, Nouriel and then Dominique to give us the five-minute potted overview of where this world economy of ours is going. So, Nouriel, you kick us off. Well, I would say there are at least uh, four important trends uh, in the global economy that are going to affect uh, countries like uh, Ukraine and other emerging markets that have some economic similarity to those of Ukraine. So I'm going to start talking about these four and then derive the implication. Uh, let's start with the United States. Uh, the recovery in the U.S. is still an anemic subpar below trend, and the Fed decided the other day not to start tapering. Uh, but tapering is going to start, maybe in October, maybe in December. And once they're done with tapering sometime next year, at some point they're going to decide to move away from zero policy rates and start to normalize to something neutral. It may take them two or three years, but you're going to go from zero towards 4%. And the same thing is going to happen maybe more slowly in other advanced economies, in the UK, in the Eurozone, in Japan, probably slower than the United States. But there'll be a process of policy normalization. And even after the decision by the Fed not to start tapering uh, this month, uh, bond yields in the United States that were as low as 1.6% before 
you know, the talk about tapering. Today, they're closer to 3%, 2.7 after the Fed decision. So that has led to a significant increase in interest rates in the US, even in Europe, in emerging markets. So that's the first observation. The era of zero interest rates that was leading to a search for yield and money, searching for yield in the emerging market now, however slowly, is going to be reversed. Second uh, trend in the global economy. China used to grow 10, 11%, now slowing down towards 7.5%. I'm among those who actually believe that Chinese growth next year is going to be 7%, closer to 6% by 2015. It's not a total hard landing, but it's a harder landing than a soft landing. And that implies already that that slowdown of growth of China, together with a change in their growth model from capital intensive and resource intensive to consumption and services, is going to imply even less so demand for commodities. And there has already been an end of this commodity super cycle in industrial metals, in agricultural products, and so on. That trend is going to continue in the next few years as Chinese growth slows down, maybe avoids hard landing, but slows down sharply. Third trend. Maybe the tail risk of a collapse of the Eurozone or Greek exit or Italy and Spain losing market access in the short run have been reduced thanks to the OMT, whatever it takes, ESM, Banking Union. But uh, the, the economies of the Eurozone are still very fragile. The recession is barely over. It's still a recession in most of the periphery. Potential growth is low because of slow reforms. The recovery is going to be anemic. Debt ratios in the periphery, private and public, domestic and foreign and high and still rising, and the problem of competitiveness has not been resolved because internal devaluation takes a lot of time. So the recovery of the Eurozone is going to be, at best, very slow, very anemic, even worse than the United States. Fourth factor that affects oil, gas, energy prices. The fundamentals of supply and demand may suggest that maybe supply is going to increase over time, shale gas in the US, offshore stuff in Latin America, you name it and the demand is maybe growing more slowly, but there is the geopolitical risk, and those geopolitical risks can be one day Syria, one day the risk of an attack of Israel against Iran, trouble in Egypt, uh, instability in Libya, as opposed to Iraq. The reality is these geopolitical noises in the Middle East, and there is an arc of instability that starts in Morocco and Algeria and goes all the way to Afghanistan and Pakistan, it's going to stay with us. It's going to stay with us for many years to come. And therefore, from time to time, a shock will occur. It's going to lead to an increase in the fear premium. It's going to keep all prices higher than otherwise. So if you think about these four factors and what they matter for emerging markets like Ukraine, you have countries like Ukraine, it's not just Ukraine, that have some commonalities. They have large current account deficits, they have large fiscal deficits, they have now falling growth in a recession, they have had high and rising inflation, they are subject to social and political instability, and in the next 12 to 18 months they're going to have also parliamentary or presidential election, you name it. One country is Ukraine, another one is India, another one is Indonesia, Another one is Turkey, another one is Brazil, another one is uh, South Africa, talking about large, important emerging markets. Now, these four trends for these countries are all going to be negative because the rise in interest rate globally through the Fed implies less money going into this market, actually coming out of this market. That has led to a correction of FX, a correction of fixed income, local currency, foreign currency. The fall in Commodity prices with the slowdown of China damages those who are commodity exporters in agriculture or industrial metals. The weakness of the recovery of the Eurozone implies that Central Eastern Europe, that depends on trade with the Eurozone, is going to have less of opportunity to export its goods and services to Europe if the recovery of the Eurozone is going to be anemic. And fourth, the geopolitical risk is going to imply that oil and energy prices, because of the fear premium, are going to stay higher because of essentially this geopolitical fear premium. That is a negative for countries like Turkey, like India, like, uh, like Ukraine, who are net oil and energy or gas importers. So this is the environment from a global point of view that implies that the policy options that these countries are facing today are difficult. There are pressure downward on their currencies, on their reserves, on their asset prices. If you want to avoid the collapse of your currency, you have to high, have high interest rates. If you do so, you kill growth, you damage banks and corporates. If instead you decide you want to go for growth and you keep interest rates lower, 
reserves are going to keep on going out and down because there is capital flight. You're going to jeopardize the financing of your current account. Eventually, you could have a currency crisis, even a debt and a liquidity crisis. So they face a very difficult dilemma right now. And many of them, in addition to macro weaknesses of having loose monetary and fiscal policy in the last few years, they also postponed structural reform. They moved away from market-oriented reform, and they moved in the direction of variants of state capitalism, greater role of state-owned enterprises and state-owned banks in the economy. This was the case of Russia, of China, of Ukraine, but also in some measure it happened in places like India or Indonesia and so on. So that's the context globally that implies that the external environment is going to be certainly difficult for these types of emerging markets, including Ukraine. I would like to uh, take away a little bit of positivity from that, Nuriel, but I'm struggling. <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling. But, but listen, I, it was incredibly persuasive, just not very attractive. <laughs> but, but, but thank you for it. And um, without wishing to push my rhyming nonsense too far, we've had a bit of doom. Are you going to offer us gloom or economic boom? Frankly, I think... Nouriel is over-optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take the four points he mentioned. In the US, I could sign on what he said. The point he let aside was that at the end, the end of uh, the zero interest rate and the beginning of tapering, whenever it happens. Plus, the fact that uh, the structural problem of the fiscal cliff hasn't been addressed at all even if it was a big problem one year ago and has just disappeared by kind of a use of a magic stick, but the reality hasn't changed, makes that uh, not only we will see uh, the consequences of increasing rates, but also the consequences on the rest of the world, but also on the US itself. So the beginning of the recovery, or let's say the rather interesting rate of growth that we have today in the United States may not last that long, or at least will not increase. So the consequences are not only for others, but also for the United States themselves. The second line by Nouriel was China. Um, I don't know what will be the rate of growth. Will it be eight, seven, maybe six, you say? My point is that it's not that much a rate of growth, which is important, but the rest of the economy. And certainly, if the Chinese begin to understand clearly that they need to rebalance, and they do it, and the recent paper in the FT was uh, very clear about that, the fact is that they're facing incredible problems for the coming years, in the coming years, starting with uh, the NPL in the financial sector, uh, going to uh, pollution, inequalities, and as I mentioned yesterday morning, maybe some of you were there, the fact which strikes me a lot which is that we're entering a phase where the center power of China is not as strong as it was before, and we are going back to a very used, very classical cycle in the Chinese history where the periphery begins to take over uh, the, the, the power facing the center. So China is going to be in big trouble, in my view, in the coming five years, ten years, as you say, that was the time span. So growth is just the result, but behind or before growth, we have a bigger problem in, in China. Eurozone. There's a kind of relief about the Eurozone. One year ago, everybody was saying Greece is going to exit. I was arguing in many forums like this one that for political, that the, the economics were clear. Greece, from an economic point of view, it was of interest of everybody that Greece will exist. But the politics of that will make it impossible and that Greece will not exist. But the market didn't believe that. So there were kind of, there was kind of angst about uh, the exit of Greece. And finally, what happened? Greece didn't exist. So it was a fantastic relief. Oh, look, things are going better. They're not going better. They're just better compared to what you had in mind before, which was wrong. Now, the reality hasn't changed. And the reality is that the Greek situation is exactly as it was before. On top of that, you have the Cyprus crisis, which has been so poorly managed for such a small economy that it add to the mess. And so the problem with Europe is that not that a crisis or a collapse will happen. The problem is that nothing will happen. And that in the coming years, we will go on with this kind of a, you know, smooth, uh, economy without reform, between zero and one percent growth, maybe sometime 1.5, everybody will say, oh, fantastic, we have growth coming back. So nothing's going to happen, but 
the fact that the European economy will not be a, a, a trigger for, the, for growth for the rest of the world. Uh, and uh, on the last point, which is, well, I won't comment too much on oil because I just agree. I will just add one point. The, 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 the country uh, uh, New Year were, was uh, quoting uh, India, Turkey, I would add uh, some is oil country, Indonesia, Mexico, uh, are fighting against the decline of their currency. And they, have, they begin to be in big trouble for this. Why? Just because the increase in their interest rate in the rest of the world, especially in the US, will attract capital from those countries back to the US or back to Europe if their interest rates grow, grow also in Europe. And so the, what we had two years ago, remember when Mantega, the Brazilian finance minister, were talking about the currency war. He was, he was uh, very angry because a lot of money came to Brazil and he had problem in managing this inflow of capital. But the problem is not going to be this one in the coming year, it's going to be exactly the contrary with the, the rise in interest rates in advanced economies. So, US, Europe, China, not talking about Japan, we could. Emerging markets are not going to go so well. So really, um, I would be happy to be as optimistic as Nouriel was, <laughs> but unfortunately, I think the context for the coming years will not be good, providing that we stop believing that there's nothing to do. If at the end of the day, the different leaders in the different part of the world decide to cooperate as they did in 2009, facing the crisis of this time, and decide to work together, not to find domestic solution to global problem, but decide to find global solution and work together in a, uh, a uh, forum that could be the G20, a renewed G20, or whatever it is, and not the, 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 the star system that has become since, then maybe we have a solution, we can find the kind of solution. But the probability of that is not that high, and when you look at the St. Petersburg meeting of the last week 20, it was more on the side of the star system than on the economic uh, uh, forum. And in this case, then I'm afraid that uh, uh, for the first time in history, uh, Nouriel Rubini vision will be optimistic. <laughs> well, um, that last point obviously takes us back to this morning and leadership or lack thereof, and that may not change in the, in the near term. So, uh, you know, long faces all round, I'm afraid, but that don't let that influence you, ladies and gentlemen. I want you all to make your own decisions because I threatened you with some democracy, and it is indeed time for some democracy. What we're going to do now is, is just explain to you uh, a little bit about how the vote works. The, uh, and, and by way of doing that, I'm just going to bring up the, the, the broad question, will the global economic context be favorable to the Ukrainian economy? There we go. That's, um, that's the f well, this is the, over this is the overarching question, which my three specific questions, which I'm about to get to, uh, will, will get an answer to. So obviously, you know, you've got two choices there. Um, you're voting, we're not, I don't think we're actually going to vote on this one, but I just want you to get used to the idea. It's not, I mean, as they say, it's not rocket science. I've got a room full of extraordinarily successful and bright people, so I don't think I need to labor this point too much. You either vote for one or the other. It's pretty simple. Um, so th that, that's really what we're getting to. Will the global economic context be favorable or not favorable to the Ukrainian economy? Now, let us move on to the first of our three specific questions, if we can. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you do actually have to do some work. You've got to vote for me. So, first question. Over the next 10 to 15 years, do you expect energy prices for Ukraine to be higher or lower than today? If you favor number one, higher, vote now. If you favor a, a sort of middling number two, or... There you go for that one, or number three, lower. Dominic, why don't you have a vote? You might as well. Oh, and we've even got a handy clock, ladies and gentlemen. I know uh, this isn't the most complicated vote you've ever had, but nonetheless, we're giving you a generous 30 seconds to make a decision. In Australia, in the recent poll, they had a ballot paper that was about six miles long, so we're very lucky today. For those of you who are very indecisive, you've only got five seconds left. And if you haven't decided by now, you're too late. 
Right. Somebody make a note of this. Our first decision is that energy prices for Ukraine are going to be lower. Uh, so may, I'll try and remember that because it's rather important. Next one. Over the next 10 to 15 years, do you expect prices of Ukraine's key exports to be higher or lower? So is Ukraine going to get higher prices for its exports or lower or the same? Get voting now, please. I guess here we're talking about commodities. We're talking about shale gas as and when it comes on stream. We're talking about wheat and agricultural products. We're talking about chocolate, although let's not forget the chocolate bean, cocoa bean doesn't actually grow in Ukraine. Uh, right, you've got four seconds left. Get on with it. Don't be, don't be shy. Right. I have to say, you lot are way more optimistic than, than our panel. So far, it's pretty good news for Ukraine. We've got um, lower energy prices, higher export prices. Let's get to the third one. And those of you who aren't Ukrainian and who want to come and live here for this golden future, you can talk to a minister afterwards. OK, next 15 years, do you expect Ukraine to face a more open or a less open global trading system? I hope Pascal Lamy's in the room because he can vote on this one along with the rest of us. You've been given 40 seconds for this. It obviously is a very difficult question because you've got lots of time. Uh, go on, get voting. Can we start the countdown, please? We'll be here forever. Here we go. You've got to admit, ladies and gentlemen, this is very exciting, is it not? <laughs> I can't remember the last time I was this excited. <laughs> this is a very steady vote. More open is, has got opened an early lead and is not going to give it up. Uh, I think everybody stopped voting because nothing seems to be happening anymore. Uh, I think it's safe to say that, oh, a late vote. Oh, uh, no. Okay. This is extraordinary, ladies and gentlemen. We have three votes, all of which indicate that, frankly, the outlook, the global economic context for Ukraine will be favorable. So, at this point, I'm going to thank our two doom-mongers very much indeed <laughs> for an extremely useful, but nonetheless not very persuasive. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, you want, you want to write a reply, do you? Go on, you can use this one. <laughs> it's a fun thing if I say somebody we're going back home that I, I tend to vote in Ukraine with 80% of, of the result, nobody will believe it was a free vote. <laughs> but the point is that the different question were not directly connected to, the, uh, to, to what I said before. No, true. Uh, it's not incompatible that it will be favorable for Ukraine even if globally the, gl the global economy is doing well. Dominic, that is a very astute point, but unfortunately, the, the questions were what they were, and we can't rewrite them now, and uh, therefore the result stands despite your late objection. So, um, uh, please, ladies and gentlemen, give a very warm hand to Nouriel Roubini and Dominic Strauss-Kahn, and <laughs> gentlemen, <laughs> gentlemen, May I invite you to leave the stage because we need to invite up our three Ukrainians to respond to this dramatic uh, piece of democracy. So thank you both very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Right, now, can I invite to the stage our three, <laughs> our three Ukrainians who are going to bravely react to the results that we've just seen? Let me introduce uh, Natalie Yaresko and... Uh, Dimitro Shimkiv, sorry, Dimitro, Dimitro Shimkiv, and Pavlo Sheremeta. Pavlo, welcome. Um, all three of you, in one way or another, expert analysts of the Ukrainian economy. Your job now, and briefly if you would, is each of you to respond to what we've just heard. Natalie, you 
have taken on the role of considering what happens in Ukraine if indeed there is this favorable economic context, at least in certain circumstances, that we've just voted for, but at the same time, we are not seeing progress in institutional reform, i.e. non-supportive. You're supportive, are you? Oh. oh, well, I've got the wrong, I've got the wrong piece of paper. Let me reframe that then. I want you to pose the scenario for Ukraine in which both the economic conditions are supportive and the institutional framework in this country is supportive. So paint us what you think can happen in those circumstances. Thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it's, it's very hard to be a speaker after so many incredibly uh, genius people have appeared here today, so I'll try and add something to this conversation. I think, I think the key thing we've been looking at in this scenario is that if you have a supportive macroeconomic context, which you've all decided we will have, and you couple that with supportive institutions, which uh, in this case what we define as supportive institutions is institutions that are driven by values, that have a vision that can be translated into strategy, that has the human potential to actually implement that strategy, and furthermore, that takes responsibility for the improvement of the welfare of Ukrainian society, that in a supportive e e economic environment, there will be actually difficulty in pushing reforms forward because there is not the pressure from the outside economy. But that said, without that pressure, in a supportive economy, there should be very concrete ways that Ukraine can use the supportive macroeconomic context to improve the situation rather rapidly. If these supportive institutions focus on taking advantage of the cushion of such a macroeconomic environment, taking advantage of the types of capital markets that would be available to Ukraine, despite the gentleman's prediction that they wouldn't be available, uh, and taking advantage of the investment flows into the country, if the institutions here, if the government here, starts to reform structurally and institutionally, frankly speaking, after 22 years of fits and starts, I believe, we believe that the, the, the international financial institutions will be extraordinarily supportive, and Ukraine can use the IMF, can use the World Bank, can use the EBRD and others to further the development and hasten, make it much more quick. In fact, what we, what we are focusing on is number one, competitive, competitiveness in the economy. Even if steel prices are positive for Ukraine, Ukraine needs to focus on finding competitiveness in other sectors, and this is the time when it can make those efforts. Number two, focusing on inv investment in infrastructure. If we're in a, a positive macroeconomic environment, the infrastructure requires ma massive investment, and this is the time when institutions ought to be focused on that. And third, focusing on the social welfare of the least developed part of the economy really focusing on providing a social safety net, a true social safety net for those who are in need. So with supportive institutions, although it's a challenge because there's the economic cushion, there is a great opportunity to use that macroeconomic environment and move Ukraine forward very, very quickly. Thank you, Natalie. Just to be clear about this, were you uh, positing supportive institutions because I told you to or because you truly believe they will be? <laughs> I truly hope they will be. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I, well put, I understand. Okay, so Dimitro, your task is to take what our audience believes will be, you know, these favorable economic conditions in, in some key ways and add into the mix non-supportive institutions and paint me a scenario for Ukraine in that, situ in that situation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Um, it's extended amazing audience and thank you Victor for having this opportunity. I think that I have an interesting perspective because it's positive and the re we're talking about the reality of today's Ukrainian institutions and I don't think they will be changing very fast and here's three reasons. The first one is lack of vision. Rising 20 points in some rating is not a vision. Vision is about putting man on the moon. Vision is becoming certain economy, certain industry, certain priorities. You can't have 200 priorities. So having a vision, I have a dream, is something that Ukraine miss. And even though there is some discussion on the top, then we go to the second reason, is the medium, middle management, or the whole pyramid of institutions. Because even though that there is a support at the top, there is no support at the middle. Look how many institutions being created today, center of economic reform, national projects, and a lot of them get stuck because the, there is no support in the middle. They have to face 
I give you just an example, one of the examples to get a Wi-Fi in the school, it's not permitted. And all these in innovative projects can die because the middle management in the institution is not supported. And the third element is about transparency of the middle management and the whole infrastructure and system. Today, Ukraine, and I like the comparison of Turkey, Brazil, uh, Indonesia, all these countries went to governance, or better, e-government, governance. They're in using technology to improve the collaboration with businesses and with the citizens. And Ukraine is discussing it for 20 years. It's still discussing. There is nobody who's responsible and nobody who's driving that. So there is three things that will not be improved, and the key thing is because there is lack of resources, so basically lack of people who will be able to take the lead, who will be inspired to, to change the country. And perspective of economic perspective, which is positive, I think that there is a couple of industries where Ukraine will be moving more from resource model to more innovation model, to added value model. And this is nanotech, biotech. It's uh, R&D center. I have a dream, Ukraine become an R&D center for Europe. Ukraine can become an interesting country for aerospace. We forgot that we have an amazing aerospace. We are one of the top 10 countries. And uh, Richard Branson is planning to, he, they already tested the second flight. So this is an opportunity for us to contribute to the space traveling. And there is uh, energy, agriculture, and everything. So I believe that Ukraine will be the country where innovation, brain power, will make the growth in the economy. And are you saying that can, you, you have faith that at least some of that can continue even with, as you would see it, institutional failure? Absolutely, and I give an example. Today, a lot of people know about Ukrainian geniuses. We've seen some of them yesterday. Do, they, do you think that any institution helped them? Do you think that anybody actually care about them? No. Actually, today, they mo have more interest and support from the businesses than actually from institution, because the lack of knowledge of understanding what is um, gas exploration of new technology, going to energy, going to biotech, nanotech, I, d I doubt that any of our people in the institution actually know what it is. Interesting. So the message to the state, sometimes just get out of the way. Absolutely. All right, well, we'll hold on to that thought. Uh, Pablo, your task, and this is, the WEF wants to sort of um, war game all sorts of different scenarios. So my instruction to you is to war game a scenario where the vote had gone the other way. Imagine, if you will, that on those key sort of economic questions, energy prices, export prices, uh, and the third one, which was the state of the global trading system, imagine they'd all gone negative for Ukraine. And then, if you would, imagine how Ukraine's institutions might cope, and paint me a scenario for that. Thank you, um, and thank you, Victor, for in inviting me here, and uh, thank you for supporting uh, Kiev School of Economics that I represent here. Well, look, I mean, this scenario is probably the definition of hell, in a way, or the definition of our next, uh, I would say, at least, at least one or two or three years, because actually, I think that the, what, what we had, uh, the confusion that we had, is I think that uh, Professor Rubini was describing the next two or three years while the question that we had was 10 or 15 years. So right. there are some people, like I would believe that uh, the, the, the forecasts are not very good for the next two or three years, but of course we, we, we want to hope that for the next 10 or 15 years they are much better. So um, since I'm going the last one on this panel, let me, let me suggest the, fol the, the following metaphor. Uh, that by the way, I learned recently. I mean, is it possible to go against the wind in sailing? And those for you who sail, you know that yes. <laughs> so I mean, but only slowly. <laughs> <laughs> well, not actually, not necessarily. Not necessarily. It depends how you put the sail. That's number one. Uh -huh. It depends on the, on the skills of the of the person who is who is managing the ship. And actually, I would think this is a much better scenario. In what way? Because if everything goes good, then people and you know, in some countries, and we, we, we know a couple, uh, you know, tend to be relaxed. You know, they always keep postponing the, the, the necessary reforms. So if the, if the environment is not so good for the next two or three years, it really should make the Ukrainian companies, the Ukrainian government to modernize, to optimize, to be more creative, to, more, to, to be more innovative, to look for blue oceans uh, with, with, with the new in innovations, uh, with the new products, with the new markets, actually. 
uh, and by the way, we are so thankful for the for for in a way for the for the sanctions that we have at the moment, uh, because it makes us focused. Uh, you know, it's um, it's the, the the phrase that I like very much. You know, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and 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 move on. And it seems like this is the the the, the future that, uh, that that we see in a way. Uh, so uh, let me finish with going back to sailing. It's the apparent wind actually that makes the sail goes much faster than the wind itself. You know, how does that happen? It's the course, uh, the, the, the wind of the course. Um, uh, and, 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 and we have some very good examples here. Uh, let's say Poland. Uh, the world was in recession. Poland was the only country in Europe that did not go into, into recession. And we all know why that happened. But one of the reasons, let me finish with that, was uh, as one, one of my Polish friends, professors, told me uh, when we were discussing why that happened. He, he, said, I mean, he, he put it bluntly, actually. He said, Pablo, let me tell you the secret. We work like dogs. Uh, and, and then I looked into the statistics, and it shows that, for example, the, the South Koreans work the longest hours. Uh, you know, Poles would be the second in this, in this ranking. So actually, there is no secret. There is no, there is no sh shortcuts. Uh, that's, that's something that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Very, very interesting. I've got one question for all three of you, and then I'm going to open it up for a quick bit of audience participation, and then we're going to eventually get to one more vote before we finish. My one question is this. Over the 48 hours of, of this um, conference, we've uh, heard from a number of the people at the very top of uh, this country's government, from the president, the prime minister, minister of foreign affairs, minister of trade and economy. Um, I hope and I trust you've heard at least some of them. I just wonder, in terms of the hopes you have for institutional reform, for good governance, whether you feel the people running Ukraine right now, and it's a phrase I've used before, but I'll use it again, get it. You start, Natalie. I actually believe they get it. I just hope they'll do it. I think that the language that we heard here, we couldn't be more proud of from our government. I think everything that's been said with regard to European integration, with regard to reform, with regard to competitiveness, is all, are all the things we want to hear and all the things that we're talking about here. But I think behind those words, we lack the institutional strength. We lack perhaps the true desire. We lack certainly the mechanisms to make those words into the reality, which would really create the change that's necessary here. Einstein said, insanity, definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. <laughs> and I think that it's absolutely critical that the change take place and the change take place, uh, I, I don't think that we can easily replace everybody, but in instilling more transparency in actions that are taking place today with the institutions, actually making sure that the actions that have been decided happen. So it's go back to execution and basic management uh, today. And this is absolutely doable. It's required desire, control, and execution. Okay. Pablo? Well, maybe a little bit inspired by this uh, Chinese lunch that we had. Is it the Chinese proverb that says that if you want to go fast, go, uh, if, you're going to, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with other people. Uh, Ukraine in 91 uh, could have split up and maybe some of the parts would be already in the European Union and moving very fast. But we decided to stay together and it's, you know, what a beautiful decision. And we are, we are arguing, we are discussing with each other. This podium was a very good example of that. Yet, I think that hopefully it takes time, obviously. I mean, that's the difference that Ukraine has from other neighboring countries, Poland, Turkey included. Uh, but hopefully that will bring us, for, will bring us further. All right, thank you. Now, I know the World Economic Forum wants to hear, uh, as part of this consultative pro process, from as many uh, Ukrainians bringing different perspectives, whether it be from public service, from business, uh, from academia. They want to hear from as many different perspectives and voices as possible. And we've, goodness knows, we've got plenty of Ukrainian perspectives in the audience. But they also, I think, are consulting with many international institutions, some of whom are represented here too. So that's my way of saying, Briefly, ladies and gentlemen, if, if any of you want to contribute to this debate before we get to our final vote, I'm sure the WEF would be interested in your contributions, and I certainly would too. So, hands up. Uh, yes, ma'am, we need to get you a, a microphone. 
Thank you so much, Arisa Lutsevich, Chatham House, London, and also Ukraine and myself. Um, thank you for this travel in time. Some optimistic, some realistic, some maybe more pessimistic. Um, I have a question to Natalie, the person who was trying to restore confidence in investment, foreign investment in Ukraine. I'm not an economist, but I've heard that we have underdeveloped investment opportunities, and I want to know what has to be done so that Ukrainians who have savings, who want to be part of Ukrainian economy, stop thinking, relying that there will be some foreign investments who will come or some, you know, magic wand, start investing themselves in development of this great potential of Ukrainian economy. Thank you. I think to some extent, it's, it's a lot to ask of the general population. There, there aren't a great number of financial instruments available to Ukrainians which may be available in other countries like mutual funds, which make it easy for an average citizen to invest in a variety of stocks. But those things are certainly in the future and in the potential. I think partly increased savings and the deposits have increased over time in Ukraine has given the banks the wherewithal if the banks were to start lending to business. It's given them a deposit base from which to do that. Un unfortunately, we're not seeing that actually happen in, in large uh, moves forward. But I think the combination of increased savings, if, if, if the population has confidence in its currency, and then other tools, other financial tools, whether they come from pension reform, which would enable some of these tools, or whether it comes from just financial reform that enables new financial instruments that let average people participate. I, I think in the end, when, when you talk about the average citizen, though, the greatest investment that they make is mom and pop shops, entrepreneurs, people who believe enough in their own economy and in their ability to, to build a business. And so part of this is about convincing the population that they can, in fact, successfully open a small bakery, open a small cafe, sell uh, clothing. And I think that's part of what's missing today and partly what the government has a long way to do in terms of convincing the population that it's realistically possible, that it's a re realistically fair and, f and free environment, and that it's going to be hassle-free, transparent, and simple. So I think there's a combination of things where Ukrainian savings, and there is a great deal of it, can be used for the betterment of the economy, but, but I think that the confidence isn't quite there yet. Okay. Matt? Uh, you've got a microphone at the front, please. Uh, Marie-Hélène Berard. Uh, I'm from France, a uh, sort of an investment consulting company. Is it true that, and the question is for the one of, between you who, who knows the answer, is it true that Ukraine has lost something like 10 million inhabitants during the past 10 years by immigration? 10 million. Well, I think it's six. We were just discussing. <laughs> <laughs> But as a, there is, a, I, I can ta talk about the the type of distribution of immigration, and I'm not an immigration expert, but let me try. At least you are here. Yeah, well, I'm here. I w I've been there. I come back. I start the company, sold there, come back, and enjoy actually working here. Um, for a lot of people, work went for pure job, just job, uh, basic job. But there's a lot of because that's what I can talk about, the innovative people, people who create things, added value, developers working in a lot of global companies. It's interesting because there's some of them would like to come back, some of them do not, because the, the world is global, and the people want to travel, and it, my industry, high-tech industry, is global. People would like to develop things whenever they are. And uh, if Ukraine creates an opportunity of attracting these people back, there is a huge, I mean, in, in, our, in Microsoft, in Apple, in Google, there is uh, Ukrainian teams. When I de come there, there is always the team who would like to help. And they can bring investors and bring people to invest in a lot of ideas happening here. I just want to mention that one, one of the initiatives that's trying to do that is uh, Viktor Pinchuk uh, in, uh, Innovation uh, East Labs, the incubator that's trying to do that. Uh, I'm going to be quite strict because we're terribly pressed for time. In fact, I'm being a useless timekeeper. But as you're looking at me so beseechingly, as long as you are super quick with a question and a super quick answer, we'll go for it. Hang on, we'll just get you the microphone. Um, I was struck by something uh, Dimitro said, so I just want to clarify. I'm from the United States, and uh, I spent most of my career in um, Russia, and I'm following very closely what's happening in Ukraine. Nevertheless, I was shocked to hear 
that Wi-Fi is not allowed in Ukrainian schools. Is that true? And if it is, how can you possibly attract parents working in Microsoft to bring their kids into this <laughs> country? I can't think of it. Well, it, it's a great, very direct question, so a very quick answer. Uh, there is a project, Open World, that's uh, exposed over there, and the team is trying to change the regulation. There is uh, a lot of focus, uh, and again, we talked about uh, middle management. There is a lot of middle management in institutions who prefer printed book books versus electronic books. There is a, yes, Wi-Fi. There is a regulation that is not allowing Wi-Fi. Um, still, people install it because schools need it, and there is, and there is a wide connection. Uh, and I think that the transformation that's going to happen with the involvement of the project Open World, that's going to change the country. All right, Dimitra, thanks. We, we, I'm going to end our question and answer session with the panel right now because I do want to invite to the stage very briefly Lord Risby, who's just going to draw some conclusions from this and explain how the WEF is going to take, take this process forward. And then we're going to have a final vote, and then we'll wrap this session. But Lord Risby, quickly give us your thoughts. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, I happen to chair the British Ukrainian Society, and one of our key objectives is simply to put Ukraine on the map. But what is really significant, I hope and believe, is that in Dubai uh, last year, pre-Davos, we set up this Global Agenda Council for Ukraine under the umbrella of the WEF. Now, in Kiev in November, the work of the WEF, which has been taking place uh, ever since then, which I hope and believe has been focused and comprehensive uh, of engagement and discussion and exercise taking place in this country, will, of course, be revealed. The tram lines, if you like, for this entire process were set at Dubai at that particular meeting. And at its heart of this process is economic reform. Now, this report will not be prescriptive, but it will indicate the areas to the Ukrainian government and others where the consideration should be given of opportunities and the priorities for reform. And I think we've had a fantastic spectrum of this from our panelists this afternoon. And I particularly praise Natalie and Pablo, who've been part of this process, which was started in Dubai. Now, we hope and believe that with the authority and credibility of the World Economic Forum, this exercise will be practical, it will be useful, it will be action-oriented in pointing out the areas for reform and also putting Ukraine firmly in focus and on the map and at this critical historic moment in the country's history. And I just say this about the country's history, and we've heard a lot about it in the last day or so. This dialogue is clearly looking to the future, and that is the critical point. Stephen, may I just end by making this point? Uh, as part of this whole process, we want to put Ukraine very firmly on the map. Next month in London, where there is going to be a festival about Ukraine. And we are going to be highlighting areas like the arts, the sport, music, culture, fashion. A dimension of Ukrainian life which perhaps too few people know about. And we'll be doing it in some of the iconic settings of London. So I would just like to thank everybody for this participation. I am excited about the process that the WEF has undertaken. It is a sign of real interest in the international community of what is going on in this country, and I hope what is revealed will be of practical help in some of the challenges that have been so, ably, so ably set out by this panel today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Risby. Um, right, ladies and gentlemen, just one, more, one quick point, Lord Risby. While we in London are very keen to celebrate all things Ukrainian, let's not go too far because we are in the same football World Cup qualifying group as Ukraine. And much as I love Ukraine, I'm seriously hoping that they don't end up higher than us in the qualifying league table. It, uh, yeah, well, we, we'll want the winner. We certainly won't be voting on that today. There are far too many Ukrainians in the audience. Um, but we have got one final vote to conduct, and it, it's a tiny bit complicated, but basically you heard three different possible scenarios facing Ukraine uh, in the coming years. Scenario one was a positive economic context, which you in the audience backed, even though our panelists weren't quite so sure, but a, a positive economic context and supportive institutions, successful governance. Scenario two was positive economic context, but not supportive institutions. And scenario three, as you can see, hostile economic context, but supportive institutions, the idea of sailing against the wind. Um, 
So, well, you want a fourth option? You can't have a fourth option. There's only three. Oh, uh, I'm going to say uh, 10 years. Think over the next 10 years. So a 10-year span for this. What is the most likely scenario facing Ukraine? No, no talking, just voting, please. You can't, can't talk, we're too busy voting. All right, we're down to the last few seconds. This is very significant, ladies and gentlemen. You collectively are sticking to your firm belief that over a 10-year span, the economic context within which Ukraine uh, will find its place in the world is going to be positive. But you are very concerned that you, the institutions of the country are not going to be supportive, are not going to be helping push the country forward and, and deliver prosperity and growth. So I think that is something that the WEF will take forward. Uh, it'll just be one more piece of input into their project on Ukraine. And with that final piece of democracy, I thank you all for participating. I thank my panel. Take a very short break, ladies and gentlemen, no more than 10 minutes, get some fresh air, and then come back straight away. So come back as soon as you can. Thank you.